Hello, my name is Stefan Pauls and I am the CEO and founder of Moonfair. Welcome to Deal Talk, where we bring you face to face with the top minds in private equity. Moonfair is the largest digital platform for investing in private equity. We offer carefully curated funds with remarkable low minimums. Joining our community of world class investors is free and only takes a few minutes at moonfair.com. We do this to give more investors direct access to one of the most attractive global asset classes. With our Deal Talk webinars, we aim to democratize access to the knowledge surrounding it. Enjoy! My name is Stefan Powitz and I am the founder and CEO of Moonfair. Welcome to our Moonfair Deal Talk series today, where I interview some of the most influential people in the global private equity industry. My guest today is Hugh MacArthur, Chairman of Private Equity Practice at Bain & Company. Hugh is one of the most respected voices in our industry. Everyone who is working and investing in private equity has came across his extensive research. Hugh had built the private equity business at Bain over more than 25 years now, and the success of this business has been tremendous. The team at Bain today has over 2,000 consultants that support private equity firms when it comes to strategy, sourcing, due diligence, value creation, and so on. There's one number that really speaks to how essential Bain is to private equity. If we think about buyouts larger than 500 million in value, Bain has been involved in more than half of these transactions since 2000. I find this truly impressive. You, I can't imagine a better guest to help us make sense of where private equity is today and where it's going. It's a huge pleasure having you today here at our Dean Talk. You, you started working at Bain and Company in 1992. Private equity was a relatively small industry back then, a niche industry, and a lot has changed since then. Today, private equity is one of the largest sources of capital for M&A globally. Actually, it stands for more than 25% of the global M&A volume. How did you experience this massive growth? Did you ever think that private equity could become so big? Stefan, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the show. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. And to answer your question in a word, uh, no, uh, none of us had any idea that this little cottage industry that we had uh, started to become a part of uh, almost 30 years ago would be a multi-trillion dollar global behemoth the way that it is today. Um, 25 or 30 years ago, the average size of a deal uh, in, in buyouts and private equity was uh, less than $100 million of total enterprise value. Today, it's nearly a billion dollars, uh, the average deal. So uh, the size uh, and complexity of the industry is something that I think no one could have possibly forecast uh, all those years ago, but it's tremendously uh, rewarding to see how amazingly successful that the industry has been over that duration. Look, you, as I said, you have an exceptional overview of private equity, and it would be great if you could help us understand where are we when it comes to um, cycle currently. Interest rates mm. are the main subject of the discussion, not only in private equity, but everywhere in the economy. And cutting interest rates is seen as the catalyst, the solution that would bring markets back to where they were before. But my personal view is this might be a little bit too simplistic. Let me explain why I'm saying this. We have seen periods of high interest rates many times over the past 20 to 30 years. Uh, just two examples. In 2000, rates have been as high as 4.75% on November 30th. They came down afterwards, but reached again 4.25% on September 2008, just when the grand financial crisis hit the economy. I remember the time before the financial crisis as one of the most active ones in private equity history until this point, despite the high interest rates. So what is different this time? Why are we seeing so little deal activity? And will a decline in interest rates, starting with moderate steps probably, be really the game changer for the industry? 
Stefan, it's a, it's a really good conjecture. <clears throat> and I think you're right that it's not as simple as interest rates, although interest rates are a big part of what's going on. And it's not so much, as you know, the level of interest rates. To your point, we've seen interest rates that have been like this before, and the industry has transacted fine uh, during those periods of time. It's the rate of change in the interest rates and how fast they went from essentially zero central bank interest rates to about 5%. We had about a 500 basis point increase across the U.S. in most markets in the, in the ECB uh, in, in 18 months. And that type of change in that short a time span really put the industry into a state of shock. And as you know, the industry go, does run through cycles about every 10 plus years or so where capital velocity ebbs and flows. Capital velocity happened to be very high prior to this change in interest rates. 2021 was the biggest year transact of transactions ever in the buyout industry. And then suddenly we had interest rates go up by 500 basis points and suddenly uh, deal makers that were used to financing at 5% debt were having to finance a 10% debt or refinance. And that shock just caused everything to stop. Uh, and the challenge that we have now is that we've got to get the flywheel really moving again. And certainly ameliorating the interest rates or moving them down is going to help do that. But at the same time, the reason why interest rates went up in many places was because we had rampant inflation, we have macro uncertainty, we have the threat of uh, recession, you know, the German economy may have contracted in the last quarter un un unexpectedly. So there are lots of things out there that are making deal makers cautious because they're not certain if the next year or two is going to be benign and in healthy conditions to transact or whether or not there may be other shoes to drop in the macro economy that uh, people are unaware of. So yes, interest rates are a very important part of getting that flywheel humming again, but they're not the only piece. And it would not surprise me at all if we're going to have to wait for another six or 12 months until people are more confident that the macro economy is as stable as everyone hopes it is so that they can start transacting again and, and get the interest rates in line. Yeah, let's take this one. Let's assume it's six, eight, nine months uh, ahead of us. The number one concern that we are hearing from investors all across uh, you know, the different segments that we are serving, family offices, but also ultra high net worth individuals and, and others, is about distributions slowing down. And distributions, of course, depend on how well and how fast managers can sell their assets. We do see some improvement in M&A markets this year, and IPOs are very, very slowly picking up. However, fundraising doesn't bounce back immediately when exits and distributions improve. This is something that I read in your famous Bain Mitchell report. According to the report, it typically takes 12 months or more for a boost in exits to produce a turnaround in fundraising. So that means even if deal making picks up this year, six, nine months down the road, it could take until 2026 before the fundraising environment really improves. What is your take on this? How long will it take for the private equity flywheel to get back into full motion? It's a, it's a good point, Stefan. I mean, fundraising is a lagging indicator in the industry. Uh, the first thing that starts and stops is actually doing the deals. Uh, then exits follow on from that and fundraising follows on from that. So it is kind of a cycle where when deals are being done, lots of checks are being written. Then we get into a period potentially where there's something that causes a pause, whether it's the GFC in 2008, 2009, whether it's this massive change in interest rates over 18 months that we were just talking about, that there's something that puts a shock in the system and that causes exits to slow uh, dramatically over time. And we get wind up then in a situation where LPs are in a cash crunch because they've been writing a lot of checks, but they're not getting a lot of checks back. And that has a knock-on effect then as a lagging indicator of making the fundraising markets much more challenging because it's difficult to commit a lot more money as an LP to write more checks when you've been writing a lot of checks and you haven't been getting a lot of cash back. And so you really want as an LP confidence about money coming back with a certain return attached to it. And if you haven't seen money in a couple of years, that makes you even more concerned about what the returns are going to be, as well as when you're going to get the money. And so then it becomes more challenging to commit more money into the private markets, into certainly the buyout markets that we've been that we've been discussing. And so that is why we're seeing the fundraising squeeze now. Uh, that's why the fundraising squeeze is going to continue, because it's simply going to take a while to work our way out of this exit issue. And people want to dimensionalize the exit issue so we can do that. There are 28,000 companies right now 
in global buyout portfolios around the world. And those 28,000 companies are worth roughly $3 trillion, depending upon the marks. If you look at the average deals done in the past year, we had over $400 billion worth of transactions, which is certainly not an anemic amount. But when you think about $3 trillion worth of assets that need to be liquidated to get that money back into LP uh, bank accounts, and we're doing four or five hundred billion dollars a year in transactions. That's a lot of years before that three trillion dollars actually gets gets worked through. And so the markets do need to recover. There needs to be an acceleration in exits in order to put money back into LP pockets. That's going to uh, then have the ability to give them more confidence in committing capital to the private equity markets. And so it is a multi-year issue is the point. It's not going to get better in three or four months. It's just there's simply too many companies, too much value that needs to come back. And it doesn't need to fully be solved until the fundraising markets actually recover. But it, we do need to be on the path towards solving it. And enough money needs to be flowing into LP coffers to give them the confidence that the issue will be solved. Yeah, let's talk about this exit slowdown for, for a minute because it has a couple of implications. You wrote in your report very interestingly that uh, you know, uh, private equity firms now are sitting on uh, more than the double of portfolio companies in their portfolios. And that leaves these sponsors you know, with an issue because you know, they have limited resources and bandwidth. What do you see in this regard in the market? How have private equity firms adapted to this, I call it, additional portfolio burden? Yeah, it, it's an interesting challenge because when you do look at the data, and this frankly surprised me over the last 10 years, the average GP now has twice as many companies in their portfolio as they did a yeah. decade ago. Uh, and whether or not the ecosystem of resources GPs have to manage those companies has grown to be double what it was 10 years ago is really the question. Because companies are not houses. It's not like we have a collection of houses we've uh, we've got to then fix up and, fl and then flip to the, back to the market. Companies are very organic um, uh, entities that require care and feeding. Sometimes uh, they require... Um, uh, you know, much more, uh, much more consultative approach. Sometimes they they need interjections of, of of capital or interjections of expertise to make sure that they're on track. So these are things that constantly need to be monitored and cared for in partnership with management. And so it, it is stretching, certainly from an industry perspective, the average GP's capability to deal with this. When you look at the fact that there are twice as many companies per GP. Uh, being held today than there were, and as we discussed earlier, if deal markets recover exits recover as a lagging indicator on top of that. So that implies there are going to be even more companies per GP before there are less going forwards. And so for a GP looking at this situation and the fact that their portfolio may continue to grow uh, before they're able to ma meaningfully sell off a lot of assets, they have to be very certain that they have enough bandwidth and talent at the board level to help companies. Uh, in the C-suite to help companies, uh, all the way down to their value creation teams and their ecosystem of external partners that, that 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 group is capable of dealing with all of these companies in the different stages of the life cycle that they're being held so that the right activities are taking place to create value and to create the kind of accretive exits that everybody wants to see. Yeah, look, you mentioned the holding periods. You mentioned, you know, the slow exit activity. If I take those two factors together, uh, Inherently, that leads to a decrease in IRR. And most funds out there, as, as you know, as I know, have an 8% hurdle before you know, the manager is in the carry. Do you see a scenario where you know, firms, private equity firms, will literally not manage to get over this hurdle you know, with their current portfolio due to the much longer holding periods? And what does this mean for talent retention and the industry in general? Well, I think, Stefan, it's absolutely going to be true that some funds are not going to make their hurdle right. Uh, this, and this is something that is typical. This should, this should not be a shock. Whenever we see a cycle in the industry, whether it's the dot-com cycle of 2001 or the GFC cycle or what we're going through now, what typically happens is about 20 to 25 percent of the GPs out there will not re-raise uh, a new fund on the back of this. Their performance will be adverse enough that the LP community will not have enough confidence to continue to bank on them as a growing concern. 
And, you know, that tends to be masked by the fact that, as we talked about at the outset of the show, private equity and buyouts in particular is, is a cyclical market, but it's a cyclical growth market. It is many times larger now than it was 20 or 25 years ago. And so more and more capital flows into the market. So it does cycle, but it's growing at the same time. And that means that GPs, uh, that LPs lose confidence in will not re-raise, but other GPs, their newer GPs will take their place. Uh, and there will be new ideas that people want to back to generate alpha and generate returns, and the industry will continue to grow. That, that has certainly been the history over time. And so while a portion of the industry will absolutely suffer, there will be another portion of the industry. You know, the top quartile always does very, very well. That does not suffer. That has figured out how to make money out of their portfolio that are doing the smart things right now on the balance sheet and to grow EBITDA. And they will easily surpass their 8% preferred return hurdle and do very, very well for the LPs. And those are the folks that are going to continue to grow and get more money and more confidence from the market versus those that, uh, that have erred and, uh, and will pay the price for it. Look, we talked about the lack of distributions, the longer holding periods and so on. And all this, of course, leads to a boom in the secondary market, who has been growing since the grand financial crisis uh, dramatically. Uh, you wrote recently in your research that expanding the market for secondaries uh, could really be a way to increase liquidity in the market, obviously, which is especially important for private investors uh, who typically have uh, higher liquidity needs. This is, by the way, why Moonfair has very recently launched our own semi-liquid secondary strategy, uh, which is seeing a strong demand from, from our investor base. However, if you think about the sheer size of the secondary market, it's still, uh, interestingly, relatively slow compared to the primary market. It's an unusual ratio mm -hmm. that you see here between primary and secondary market. What needs to happen that secondary markets who have been growing, but really achieve critical scale. Absolutely right. I mean, secondary markets will need to grow. Uh, and as you pointed out, we, we have a, in the private markets, almost an inverse situation that you typically see. Usually the secondary markets are many times larger than the primary markets. And in private assets, private equity in particular, we have the reverse. So in private assets, we've got about $20 trillion dollars uh, as a market size. And the secondary markets are about $120 billion dollars a year. Uh, and so that is a tiny, tiny fraction of what's necessary to provide real liquidity for the markets. And as those private markets have grown dramatically in the last few years, all types of investors need liquidity for different reasons. And so the case for supersizing the secondary markets is absolutely there at an institutional level, but also as an individual level. As more individuals actually put money into the private assets markets, they're going to need liquidity too. Uh, secondaries are actually a great way to get in, invested in private markets. People like the the accelerated J-curve. They like the ability to get money back sooner. And so there are lots of forces here that are saying more secondary would be good. One of the questions is who's going to provide it and where's that money coming from? Uh, and so there's interest in the part of sovereign wealth funds. There's interest on the part of traditional and newer institutions. New GPs are now getting much more into the secondary markets. And I mean primary GPs much more into the secondary markets than they have in the past. And so there's a lot of interest in financing and creating a secondary market that is many times larger than the secondary markets that we see today because everyone understands there is a need for more liquidity, whether you're rebalancing your portfolio or whether you need to sell or whether you find something else more attractive that you, you want to go and buy. The ability to price and effectively transact at the secondary level has to go up. Uh, in order for these markets to continue to grow in the way that they have in the past. And I think there are a lot of interested parties in making that happen. And at least in my business career, whenever everybody lines up on the same side of the pitch and says, we'd really like this thing to happen, it tends to happen. It's an interesting point. Look, I want to share um, something that we came across when we analyzed our investor data. Uh, what we are seeing currently is a bifurcated behavior within our investor group. Uh, sophisticated private investors from private equity or from the M&A industry are currently extremely interested in secondary products, while investors that are less close and less sophisticated, less close to the industry are preferring other products. What is your view? Is it a good time to invest in secondaries? It's a fantastic time to invest uh, in secondaries. It is absolutely, as we've just discussed, a growth market. It's also just about the only asset class that I can find where even the entirety of the fourth quarter generates a positive return. Uh, so on an objective level, uh, it is 
absolutely a very fundamentally attractive asset class to to put money into. And people are recognizing this. When we do surveys of institutional investors, they are all telling us that they're planning on increasing their exposure to secondary markets over time because they view it as a very attractive place to invest. And we talked about the accelerated J-curve. That makes it even easier, if you will, to manage their overall liquidity in different portfolios if secondaries make up a bigger part of that. So it's profitability, it's liquidity, it's growth. There are a lot of things going for the secondary markets that make them attractive for investors right now. Look, we talked about fundraising, but I want to dive into one point that I found uh, in particular interesting. Uh, we have seen fundraising activity last year. Think about XUT's uh, mega fund, uh, CVC, and other very, very large players uh, raising record fund levels. But there's one important caveat, which is most of the money that has been raised really goes to the established global, uh, often large cap uh, managers, while emerging managers are struggling or smaller uh, private equity players. So what does this mean? Do you be, see a world where we are, or an evolution in which really large multinational, multinational asset managers get the bulk of the pie, while smaller players might disappear over time? Is there still space for them? What, what we're seeing, Stefan, is really what I call a barbelling of the industry. Uh, it is absolutely true that there is some consolidation at the top. The larger players are getting bigger. If you just look at the first quarter of 2024, 10 funds took up 64% of all the capital raised. 10 funds, 64% of the capital. Last year in 2023, 20 funds took 50% of all of the capital that was raised. So absolutely, the larger, more trusted names are getting bigger. But at the same time, the buyout world in private equity has always been about innovation, has always been about entrepreneurialism. And we see new ideas all the time at generating alpha, whether they're specialist funds, whether they're underwriting certain types of risks or sectors or subsectors, that there's always something new there that catches LPs attention as a way to generate alpha and boost returns. And so the appetite for something new and different may be stalled right now because of the fundraising pinch that we've discussed, but it has traditionally been a lifeblood of the industry and something that LPs find very attractive and because it's generated a lot of returns that those smaller funds exist. I think some of the concern is for those funds that are in the middle, uh, you're not innovating and saying, wow, here's something totally different that's going to generate alpha. You're not at the top end of, of the food chain and you have enough resources to do whatever it is that you set out to do and you can be compelling in that, but you're kind of in the middle where there can be some LP concern around, well, where is your differentiation in the middle? How are you? Are you innovative? Are you are you fit for purpose for the next five or 10 years as you were the last 10? But prove to me that you've got the resources, capability and differentiated repeatable model that you in the middle can actually go and continue to generate attractive returns, as well as the folks that have all the resources at the large end or the shiny new idea at, at the smaller end. Look, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, when you see, you know, certain players really specializing on one country, on one vertical, on one theme, you know, they probably have a reason for living. And then we have the large multinational players with their operational teams. And we'll talk later about how they create Alpha for their investors. Look, Moonfair stands, as you know, for this phenomenon, uh, democratization of private equity. And I want to talk a little bit about private equity goes retail. What we are seeing is that mm -hmm. more and more private equity players, in particular the large ones, think about the Blackstones, but also EQT and, of course, KKR, are building out their own distribution teams and want to go more and more direct to consumer. How do you see this trend evolving? Do you see a scenario where the KKRs of this world really go direct to consumers and collect a 100K check and circumvent the intermediaries? Uh, I'll start by saying somewhat, yes, we see that trend moving in that direction, but there are many, many ways to go retail. Uh, and there are many players that are going after individual people to get their checks and to get provide exposure to the private markets. Let's start with some context, but why is that? Well, people have noticed that half of all global wealth resides with individuals. So 50% of all global wealth is non-institutional. We've also observed that institutions are right now in a bit of a cash flow pinch, and it's difficult to raise money from many of the traditional sources of, of, uh, of capital, those same institutions. Yet individuals as a group have very little exposure to private markets at all. And so the GPs around the world are looking and saying half the world's wealth, very little exposure to private markets. 
it's going to be easier to raise money over there. And so I want to go over there and talk to individuals. And so that's why we see this mass movement into the individual or retail channel on the part of GPs because they see the white space and they realize that there's probably a first mover advantage to going and exp- for first, uh, there's probably a first mover advantage to going and exploiting that white space. The question is, how do you do it? Now, if you are among the very largest asset managers, you know, the trillion dollar range or soon to be trillion dollar plus range, do you have the resources to go and do that yourself? Probably yes. Uh, and there will be a couple of players that do that. However, there are a lot of other ways to reach individuals. Obviously, Moonfair is one of those ways, being a technology platform where you can directly interact with individuals and get exposure to the markets. But there are uh, wealth managers. There are traditional asset managers that are starting to provide private product. There are lots and lots of ways to actually get at the individual. The key is going to be, I believe, in educating individuals around private markets, what's attractive, what isn't, how to think about it. Because when we survey high net worth individuals and we ask them, can you name a manager that provides private product? The number one answer that we get is, I don't know. And when the number one answer you get is, I don't know, that means there needs to be a lot of education in the market. And that really is the key, is providing the education so people can have the confidence in what they're investing in as much as who are they, who's providing the channel to actually invest. Look, I couldn't be, uh, agree more. Uh, you, the, the education part is is so important. But you know, let me build on what you have said because when it comes to private individuals, and you know, when we take people coming to our platform less familiar with private equity, and we have many, many, you know, great funds there. Some of them from the big managers, but also you know, specialized alpha generating top managers, top quartile over over years, but they don't have the big brand name of the KKRs or EQTs or KKRs, um, uh, Blackstones and Sinvins. You know, what we see is that there is a tendency that private individuals less sophisticated or less familiar with private equity are, are buying the brands. And this would mean that the entire private equity goes retail trend is even more enforcing the positioning that the large asset managers get the bulk of the pie also in private individual markets. So what would you advise mm-hmm. if I am a smaller firm and I want to really leverage this incredible strategic trend of democratization of private equity uh, and, and tapping into the pool of private investors? What would you advise me as a smaller player? What shall I do? It, it's really about building portfolios. You need to understand that the private investor needs to have a portfolio of solutions just the same way that an LP does. And learning how to be a part of a portfolio is a critical piece of this. So whether you're going straight to Moonfair and getting education online, or whether you're going through a wealth manager, or whether you're going through some other channel, understanding that you need to build a portfolio. And as a smaller GP, you have a place to play in a portfolio. Not everything can be mega cap, you know, US, Europe, global buyouts. That is certainly a segment of the market. It's not the only segment of the market. As you pointed out, there are sector specific funds and technology and healthcare. There are middle market funds. There are geographically specific funds. You would like in the same way in the public stock market, you get exposure to lots of different industries, companies of different sizes, lots of different geographies. You want that same exposure in the private markets. Now, but the key difference in the private markets is that private markets and private equity is an actively managed asset class. There is no beta solution right now. There is no passive. You're investing in an active manager who is genuinely trying to buy a company and create value with that company in partnership with management and then sell it, hopefully being it it being much more valuable several years down the road than when you bought it. That's a different exercise than kind of moving with the market and taking a passive investment strategy. That type of strategy does not exist in the private markets. At least it doesn't exist right now. And so you have to keep in mind that, yes, you want to build out a portfolio of different exposures, but you also need to evaluate the manager because whether you're in the lower middle market or the middle market or the mega cap size doing deals, it's actually the best managers that generate alpha or excess return. And that's what you're after as an individual, the same way that an institution would be. Fully agree. Fully agree. You. This is why, in addition to the brand names on, uh, at Moonfair, you will find those alpha generating managers. They might not have a great brand name, but in many cases, you know, they are, they are top performing managers over, over a long period of time with specialized teams that they are going after. 
Look, I want to talk about the role of technology for the private equity industry uh, a bit and start, you know, with, with blockchain. Uh, you remember, and we talked about it uh, in another um, a podcast, you remember two years ago, uh, every large GP was, was uh, talking about uh, what can blockchain do for the investment process? How can we leverage the technology to make the process even smoother? KKR tried something out with a firm in Singapore. Partners Group was tokenizing one fund. Um, and it came to a quite radical stop when the FDX scandal happened and people mixed up blockchain and, and crypto and everything. But do you mm -hmm. see... Uh, the technology, or can you would you foresee for the future that LPs and in particular private investors buy tokenized funds soon that are trading over an exchange? And related to this, what are the current hurdles that prevent this from happening? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Stefan, I think you're absolutely right that you know things have come to a grinding halt because there's been a loss of confidence in things like blockchain because of the different scandals that we've seen and because of confusion in the marketplace over what yeah. is real trading and transacting infrastructure and what is marketing or other things on top. And there's a, that confusion, I think, is is has persisted. Um, Will it clear? I mean, yes, it will clear. You know, we're talking about if you look at the expanded market for that what we call financial services globally, it's 20% of global GDP. And 20% of global GDP is still being run in a 19th or 20th century fashion. And that we know that that can't continue uh, forever. And, and blockchain is a technology that's going to help solve the problem and help transact much more efficiently at much lower cost for individuals and other institutions in many areas, private markets included. So will this problem be solved? Yes, it absolutely will be solved. Uh, now we've hit a speed bump. Is it going to take potentially several years before we get back on track to solving it? Yeah, I think so. Because in addition to making sure that the technology is there, robust, people understand it, people trust it. You've obviously got regulators that have to be comfortable with it. You have valuation issues uh, for private markets, which are challenging. So there are other things that, that people need to sort of make sure that they, quote unquote, get right uh, in order to make sure that the markets can function smoothly and things can be traded in a decentralized fashion and get those efficiencies and get those lower costs that we've been talking about. But the technology does exist. And so, again, as I said, with secondaries in my... In my experience, when everybody wants something to happen, they just want to believe it's happening in the right way, things tend to happen. It's just going to be a question of resolving some of those hurdles and how quickly they're resolved until we see that kind of trading occur. Hey, look, I want to talk about another trend in, in technology. AI is you know, obviously um, the talk in town. 75% of all S&P 500 companies uh, in the first quarter were mentioning AI and generative AI in their earning calls. And of course, AI will change and disrupt many industries. And I want to talk a little bit about what does AI or what will AI bring and mean for the private equity industry. And uh, maybe we start with the investment process. What do you foresee um, uh, will AI do to and, and, and contribute or change when it comes to you know, think of data analytics as one example. Uh, think about the due diligence process. Uh, might even be uh, in the identification sourcing phase of deals. What will, uh, in which regard, will AI uh, impact the investment process? I think it's all of those things, Stefan. I think that AI is going to be, uh, on the one hand, a great productivity enhancer uh, for investors, uh, and speed to insight is absolutely crucial when doing deals. So. Whether it is you know, speeding up the due diligence uh, process by being able to automate and look at lots and lots of data and enable it to be summarized much more rapidly and accurately than ever before, whether it's uh, back office efficiency processes, whether it's writing investment memos, uh, there are lots of things that are done extremely manually in the investment world today, and automating them with intelligence is going to number one, reduce cost. Number two, increase speed to insight, uh, which is absolutely critical to getting the confidence to underwrite something and buy it. And number three, it may actually, to your point, make sourcing more efficient. You know, we begin to see, we've begun to see in the industry a little bit of a change in the sourcing philosophy of a lot of managers as we've had 
growth in specialization or hyper specialization and what different GPs are focused on, they're not interested in whatever thousand books they can get in through the door that, that people may be selling companies for over the current year and then sorting out the few that they actually want to buy. They need to be looking for very specific things because the narrower my strategy is, the narrower my aperture is on what I want to buy. And so I need to begin to proactively build a pipeline of companies that I might want to buy if I'm a more specialist investor, whether or not they're for sale. And so therefore finding those companies and using technology intelligently to be able to find them and build my own pipeline of assets, I might buy two, three, four or five years from now and knowing why I want to buy them and beginning to learn about them now is becoming more present and more important in the industry. And AI and certainly technology writ large has the ability to actually help accelerate that process for investors. And that's really, it's a game changer in the, in the process when you think about it, because if I can do one more deal uh, or two more deals in a portfolio by identifying a company that I otherwise would not have come across and would have missed, that's a huge change in the return profile of that potential fund. Look, that makes total sense to me. There's an interesting study I came across recently. It was from Deloitte or so. They have asked portfolio companies, private equity-backed portfolio companies, but also family-owned businesses, whether they already invest in AI. And uh, it came out that only 25% of the family-owned businesses are heavily investing in AI, but 50%, more than double the number, uh, uh, in terms of percentage uh, of private equity owned companies. So what what is your view? What um, will, uh, when it comes to managing the portfolio, what will AI change? And what are the specific use cases that you're seeing in the industry? It's an interesting, um, it's an interesting adoption curve, Stefan. I think, you know, there is definitely uh, what they call FOMO, fear of missing out uh, going on in the, uh, in the private equity world. Everybody knows that AI is going to do something. What is it? Where is it going to be? What sectors? What companies? What do I need to be on top of? So most investors are asking themselves uh, that question very urgently, which is why we see a lot of activity. Like any new technology, the adoption curve is going to move slower, I think, than people would like, because typically what we see are the more obvious use cases being addressed first. Um, so, you know, very lower value, highly repetitive tasks being automated, upgraded and replaced is what we tend to see. And so you're able to move the needle in a portfolio company on EBITDA, most certainly. But it's not one or two blinding insights that are driving the value. It's 15, 20, 30, 40 small projects that are each contributing a little bit more efficiency, a little bit more uh, automation, a little bit better service uh, that actually is driving the needle on EBITDA. Now, I have no doubt that a few years from now, we're going to see some true game changers in industries and some industries will be fundamentally reshaped by the way AI is being deployed. But for now, it's putting a few runs on the board and understanding what the technology can do and what the technology still cannot do for businesses that I think many GPs are, are exploring in partnership with their management teams. Yeah, look, BCG um, recently published a number that um, this year, 25% of all their revenue is coming from AI-related consulting. And I guess the number is very similar uh, on, on, on your end. But when we leave AI for uh, a second uh, out of the equation, what else, what are the current challenges that private equity firms come to you for, for support, except of AI-related consulting? Well, there's a lot going on in the portfolio, and there's also a lot going on at the GP level. You know, at the GP level, I think there are a lot of fundamental questions around strategy uh, that are being asked. We talked a lot about fundraising. I think the professionalization of fundraising, whether you're talking about from individuals or institutions, is something that the industry is grappling with. Uh, for the last decade, we've had uh, zero central bank interest rates. We've had steady GDP growth across most markets in the world which creates an incredibly set of benign conditions to generate attractive returns. And the industry has had a very good time in generating good returns, which makes it quite easy to raise a lot more money if you're generating good returns. We're now at some level toward the end of that era or at the end of that era. So figuring out uh, how to raise money, what a good organization looks like to do that, what a world-class practice looks like to do that over the next five or 10 years is a big issue uh, for most GPs. And in, on top of that, once you think about raising lots of money, many GPs are realizing that a lot of the private asset classes that they've invested in or maybe want to invest in are maturing uh, over time. And so 
if they want to play in a different asset class. If I'm a buyout fund and I want to play in infrastructure or real estate or credit or some other type of private asset class, that's harder uh, than it was 15 or 20 years ago because all of those asset classes are maturing and there are mature players doing well in it. So do I need to buy into those markets? Do I need to uh, organically grow? And if so, how? But all of those feed into if I've got questions about if I'm going to be raising money and I'm going to be investing in new asset classes, maybe I should think about as a firm, as an investment firm, what do I want to be in five or 10 years? What is my ultimate ambition? You know, what, what is it exactly that we want to look like in the context of the evolving private markets world? And how are we ensuring that we're setting ourselves up for success at the talent level, capability level, technology level, all the way up uh, into what I'm focusing on in terms of investments and where I'm focusing on them? So there's a lot of introspection around trying to be sure that the strategy and enablers for its execution are there uh, at the investor level going forward in, in all aspects, uh, as well as concerns about uh, the current portfolio. Now, the concerns about the current portfolio, as you point out, involve everything from technology to how do I really ensure that I deliver the kind of liquidity that my LP partners want to see in the right time frame. Uh, and so there's a liquidity return trade-off uh, that, that, that people need to make. And that's usually some combination of growing EBITDA for portfolio companies because the best, I say it often, the best bug spray for things like interest rates or other things that are causing problems with multiples is to grow EBITDA as fast as you possibly can. That solves a lot of problems. And or if I need to work on the balance sheet, what do I need to do in order to fix the balance sheet? Am I going to put a little bit more capital in? Am I going to negotiate with the banks? Am I going to create a continuation vehicle? What am I going to do on the balance sheet side as well as the EBITDA growth side in order to provide liquidity and attractive returns for my LP partners? That, that is the short term question. But the longer term questions we're getting are very much around the strategy, the future, the ambition and how to execute on that, because people are recognizing that particularly with the introduction of individual capital, the private markets are only going to get more dynamic. They're going to grow faster over time. They're going to be much larger and more complex. And if you're not planning what success looks like over the course of the next decade, then you might be left behind. Yeah, look, you're saying is the market opportunity in private markets is 10 times larger than in public markets if you take companies from the US uh, over 100 million in, in revenue. Look, let's talk uh, a bit more about value creation. And I know that the, but you personally, but also, of course, the firm is a big believer in uh, operational um, value creation. And I would uh, love to lean on your experience from what you see. Are there any particular private equity firms without naming them, but that are exceptionally good in value creation and what makes them good? What is the approach they are taking? It's it's a really good question. Um, and if you look at the industry's history, Stefan, over the last 10 years, when you look at all of the deals and where the value has come from in the deals, uh, half the value uh, in all deals exited came from revenue growth. Half the value came from multiple appreciation or expansion. And zero came from multiple uh, margin expansion. Uh, that's an extraordinary story for those of us that have been bouncing around the private equity world for 30 years, because as you well know, private equity started, it was about leverage and margin expansion <laughs> of, of, of dented cans, if you will. And that's how I made money. So to see a decade where we've literally had multiple expansion and revenue growth driving 100% of the returns and margin expansion driving none of it is shocking. And of course, the zero interest rate environment at the central bank level that we've been talking about has enabled a lot of that to happen. That's not the case, and it's not going to be the case going forward. So those that are good at value creation are going to have to dust off the muscles around margin expansion in order to create the kind of returns that everybody wants to see in the industry going forward. There are investors that are doing this today. There are investors that have done it in the past, and they're going to continue to do it. But the market as a whole has kind of let those muscles atrophy a little bit and need to actually get back to figuring out how to make margins go up over time. And that's not just cost reduction. It's certainly, yes, there is a value investor orientation around cost reduction that uh, is a well-known playbook to those investors that follow that strategy. And it's all about doing carve outs and taking out inefficiencies and reducing costs where, uh, where it makes sense to do so and creating a much stronger organization. But as the industry shifts to back 
more technology-based businesses, and I'm not just talking about software here. Software is relevant, but you talk about financial technology. We talk about tech-enabled business services. We talk about healthcare IT. There's technology in a lot of buyouts in a lot of different sectors right now, and it means that the market is underwriting growth more than it ever has in the past. And underwriting growth does not have to be at a counterpoint to margin expansion because getting true operating leverage as something grows and expanding margins the way you should is a skill. And there are some investors that do very, very well at that. They understand what the full potential of margins might be in software. They understand the rule of 40 or the rule of 50 or the rule of 60 or 70 or whatever the full potential might be and how to get at it. And they use those muscles and value creation to actually make sure that they get the margin as well as the revenue growth. And I think it is this increased focus, whether you're a value investor or a growth investor, on making sure the margin part of the story is there, that's going to be a big unlock for future returns, or it's going to be a big problem. Because I can tell you from sitting on our co-investment committee at Bain that has been invested in deals for 30 years, I've never seen a deal model that has 50% of the value creation and revenue growth and 50% in multiple expansion and zero in margin expansion. They just don't exist. And so we need to get back to actually walking the walk and not just writing the deal model for margin expansion and then not getting it. Yeah, look, this is why more and more players, in particular the, the large ones, and KKR was one of the first ones, are building out their own in-house operational teams. Uh, that followed, at, uh, in the case of KKR, the famous quote from Henry Kravis early 2000 when he said, Financial engineering is over. Um, there are various models out there, in-house operating teams, you know, then of course leverage with a specialist and consultants like Bain and others. Uh, AQT is pursuing a different model. They don't have uh, operating partners. They have the, what they call the Troika model, where they have an external chairman and the deal uh, partner and uh, the CEO basically um, um, driving the operational value agenda. Do you have a preference for any model? Or do you say this model works better than another one? I think there are models that work you know, less well. Uh, trying to do too much uh, yourself is difficult for most investors. So we would never go to an investor and recommend, well, you should try to uh, you know, build your own consulting company inside of the, your firm. Uh, typically, that's not a good use of resources or time. Uh, that's why consulting firms exist. But what I talked about earlier is having an ecosystem of folks that you can call on. There are some folks that will be on your payroll as a GP. There'll be other experts or, or advisors that you have. There'll be networks and relationships with other external parties that you need that you may call on in different ways for each investment. I think the most important thing in value creation, Stefan, is not necessarily what your particular ecosystem looks like and how many people are on your payroll and what they look like versus what you're you're using in, as part of your network. It's much more what is the rigorous, repeatable process that you're going to do every single time with every asset that you buy. Are we going to start and ask, what is the full potential equity value of this asset? Not what's in the deal model, but the full potential equity value of, of the asset. And then what are we going to do to unlock that? And who's going to do what? And how do we partner with management in order to get that done? Those are the questions, I think, that need answering. And that's the process that we like to see done in a rigorous way with every asset. Because if that process is being done, regardless of who's doing it, presuming you have the right capabilities from somewhere to execute, you're far more likely to minimize your risk and maximize your return. If that process is haphazard, not well-defined, not being done every single time, it doesn't really matter how much talent you have or where it is. You're not going to get to where you need to want, where you want to be in terms of your overall performance as an investor. Thanks for this, you. Um, you, you co-authored a book some time ago uh, titled Lessons from Private Equity Any Company Can Use. In this book, you talk about uh, six things that give private equity firms an edge, but that any company out there can use to their advantage. What are these principles? Well, I'll quickly enumerate them, and then I'll, I've mentioned one already, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stick on a couple just for, um, uh, for a little elaboration. They are firstly to define the full potential of the business, uh, develop the blueprint to getting after the full potential, being able to accelerate your performance then, making sure that you harness the talent uh, that needed in order to execute on the blueprint. What we call making equity sweat, which is a way of saying, use your assets as efficiently as, as, as possible. And then fostering really a results-oriented mindset, which means measure and iterate over time. Now, the first two that I like to talk about because they really set the table for the, the last four, which are all about execution, are defining the full potential, which is simply 
in an unconstrained world, how high can equity value go? Uh, we talk about things like deal models. Deal models are financing documents. They are not necessarily what is the unconstrained full potential equity value of a business. That is a different question. But answering that question with facts so we understand how high the equity value could be is a critical first step. The second step I'm calling, you know, develop the blueprint. What is a blueprint? Well, a blueprint is a set of documents you use typically to build something. In this case, we're going to be building value for a company. And those blueprints are most effective in our experience when they're built around the top three or four or five value creation levers to get at that full potential equity value. In the same way that no person can do 15 or 20 things at once and do them all very well, no company can do 15 or 20 things at once and do them equally well either. And so focusing on the three to five big issues that are really going to matter and making sure that you execute 100% on all of those is the best way to get toward that full potential. And once you get the facts and the confidence that you've defined the full potential prop properly, and that you have the blueprint for getting after the full potential, then you can talk about how do we accelerate? How do we get the right talent? How do we, it all sort of follows from that. But if you don't get those two things right, then very little of the rest of it is going to matter. Look, you, you know, Moonfair's mission is to democratize private equity and alternatives in, in general. And we talked about it. This is really a, a mega theme in the industry. The private equity industry is pushing for it, but also, you know, the asset managers think of the Vanguards, Fidelities, Blackrocks. Uh, you know, the banks are, are becoming more and more active. And this trend really is, is evolving. We talked about education and the role uh, that it, play, it, it takes um, to um, really make this uh, the huge opportunity everybody is believing in. Uh, education is one element. Uh, then, of course, the right products. Uh, there are more and more uh, retail-oriented products coming to the market. The semi-liquid is a big theme when we talk to the GPs. So I want to ask you, how do you see this trend evolving? Where do we stand when it comes to the democratization of private equity, let's say in 10 years from now? In 10 years from now, I think the individual will have tremendous access to private markets, uh, Stefan, because we're, we are in the midst of a secular trend and movement into private markets on the part of institutions and individuals over time. People are less happy with the alternatives of putting more and more money into the public markets. Now, why is that? Public markets are not a bad place to be at all. But if you take the United States as an example, there are less than half the public issues out there to invest in than there were 15 or 20 years ago. There are only about 4,000 public companies in the US that you can invest in. And if you look at the S&P 500 or the way a lot of the markets work, it's maybe seven of them are moving the market or maybe it's one, depending on which, which stocks you're picking. And everybody's excited about investing in technology and seeing their holdings grow in value. But how much of your portfolio do you want in that really until you say, gee, that's good. I've had enough. Now let's go look at something else. And, and you pointed out something earlier about private markets being many times larger than public markets. And I've heard it also said that, you know, when you think about the public markets and the private markets, in the public markets, you've got 90% of the money chasing 10% of the global investment opportunities. In the private markets, you've got the opposite. You've got 10% of the money chasing 90% of the opportunities. So the room for growth in private markets is absolutely massive. The question is, what is the education required to give people confidence in investing in these markets with names that they don't necessarily know and they don't necessarily understand? And you described, I think, a trend that we're seeing very well, which is as well, which is this confluence of traditional asset managers coming into the market, as well as digital and technology providers and platforms such as Moonfair. And you've got the GPs and the traditional GPs that are all trying to figure out how do we educate people? How do we provide product? How do we sort of ensure that we are giving people the confidence to give a, a healthy allocation into private markets as well as the liquidity features they need and the capabilities to manage that uh, and do it in a way that, um, that will feel comfortable? That is the biggest challenge to me in saying 10 years down the road, we'll all be trading private assets very similarly to the way that we're trading public assets, which I believe that we will get there. But it's really a, this question of education. We're starting from a very low level of individual education uh, around who provides these funds, what do they really do, how do they really work, why are they creating value, how can I be trusting that there's going to be repeatable value over time, what does a good portfolio construct look like, 
all of those questions need to be answered in a way that they're not for the, the by and large for the the individual today and they will be but it's it's like a it's like a student starting out in second or third or fourth grade you know you're not reading shakespeare in fourth grade but by the time you get to high school you can hopefully understand shakespeare and a bunch of other great authors and you'll be much more comfortable with it so i think it is a multi-year journey but i think it's a journey that's well worth taking and it's a journey that many many people will take yeah look i couldn't agree more when it comes to education Uh, think about there is a huge also responsibility that comes along with it for the entire ecosystem, the private equity players, but also the distributors. Uh, you know, when when people read semi-liquid, yeah, they really have to understand it's not liquid. It's not like a stock that you can sell immediately. You remember, you know, uh, Stephen Schwartzman uh, in in uh, the TV shows explaining B read and B credit when people suddenly wanted to sell these products and couldn't sell the, uh, the product. So there's really a very, very strong element that the industry has to, to take on board and to understand and uh, take it as a number one priority and responsibility. But apart from education, is there anything else you can think of which might prevent this trend, this democratization or private equity goes retail from happening? I don't think so. I don't think there's anything that's going to prevent it. I think the slowest moving lever is always going to be regulation. Uh, you know, regulators are, there are many regulators, right, geographically and, and across different asset classes. And so what regulation are we going to see where and how long is that going to take to develop so that individuals are going to be given unfettered access to private markets, I think is really the exam question that will be the gating constraint. So it won't stop. Uh, anything from happening, but it can obviously slow it down uh, tremendously over time. There's just simply too much interest in individuals investing in private markets for this not to happen. And by that, this is another one of those situations where everybody wants the same thing to happen. If you're an individual, you say, gee, why can't I get access to these exciting opportunities that uh, only institutions get? If you are a provider of product, you say, gee, half of global wealth, why can't I get access to that and give it to people? If you're an intermediary, like a wealth manager or a traditional asset manager like Fidelity or BlackRock or Vanguard, you're saying, gee, I've got all the public product I need. I want private product to actually sell to people as well. And so everywhere around, every stakeholder wants this to happen, which tells me that it's going to happen, subject to the limits of education, technology, and regulation, and how quickly those things get aligned. Uh, it could happen very, very soon. Not necessarily the kind of blockchain daily trading thing that you and I were talking about. That might be a 10-year off in the future idea. But the notion that individuals will be investing a reasonable allocation of their wealth into private markets, I think, is coming much sooner rather than later. Yeah, look, in this regard, the EU has taken a quite uh, uh, innovative approach, I would say, also when you compare to other regulators by launching this LTIF 2 regime. Um, LTIF is basically a regime that now allows for certain retail investors to invest with 10,000 euros in a, a basket of, of funds or a um, combination of funds and uh, co-investments or similar products. And this is uh, you know, where huge hopes are when you talk to the GPs. We at Moonfair, of course, as we are spearheading this democratization theme in the industry, have, of course, also developed our own LTIF building on the LTIF 2 regime. Um, but, you know, LTIF 1, which was another product, was, was disappointing. Uh, do you see that this new products really gain traction, uh, you know, as quickly as people are, are expecting? Or do you say, well, this education theme you know, more transparency, um, maybe, you know, um, a broad product range and so on. Many banks have to be trained uh, who haven't sold uh, private equity in the past. Or will it take much longer before LTIF or similar retail products really become a meaningful source of capital for the industry? That's it, really a good exam question for the industry, Stefan. And my, you know, my crystal ball is as cloudy as anybody else's here. I, I think personally, it's going to happen a little faster. I think we're going to continue to see product innovation to make products simpler and more attractive for the individual to invest in with the right liquidity that it takes the bar down uh, in order to to invest in them. So we're already seeing around the world there are probably 
um, 30 different products out there in the market now that in U.S. terms, we would call uh, 40 Act compliant uh, funds and private assets where you, you're not committing capital and writing checks over years. You write one check at the beginning. You don't have to file a K-1 and lots of complicated tax documents. It's one 1099 document. Those, pro- those products exist. So if I can invest in the private markets and it feels like I'm investing in a mutual fund, that's a home run. For the industry, if I can make it that simple, and those types of products exist, not many of them are scaled, and scaling is going to be the big challenge for these products because that's where we're going to need secondary markets and liquidity and a lot of the things that we've talked about on this show. But the fact that these products already exist today and they're going to be marketed, and products like them that you've been describing exist, tell me that the marketing challenges, yes, and the educational challenges are there. But if I make it easy for you to invest and I make it feel like it's not that risky, and I make it simple uh, and low cost, then chances are we're going to see more money sooner in, in, in private markets from individuals. You, I would love to continue our discussion, but unfortunately, we are already at the end of today's Deal Talk session. Let me thank you so much for this insightful and really um, interesting discussion and conversation. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I hope uh, our audience too. Um, with respect to the audience, thank you as well for being our guest today and for everyone joining us and uh, for participating. I hope to see you at our next Deal Talk session again. Thanks a lot. Stay healthy. Thank you, Stefan.